Okay, so welcome back everyone. We're now made it to the final session for the day. I'd like to thank everyone for hanging in there. Um, so for our third session, uh, which is titled Research in the Stakeholders Perspective, Enablers and Barriers that Affect the Integration of Genomic-Based Clinical Informatics Resources in the Healthcare System, our two co-moderators for this session are Dr. Patricia Deverka and Dr. Siddharth Pratap. Dr. Deverka is an Executive Director at Deverka Consulting, uh, where she assists in biotech companies, she assists biotech companies and startups in the evidence development and clinical adoption of innovative technologies. She has extensive experience with drug and diagnostic product development, reimbursement planning, cost effectiveness, analysis, and bioethical issues surrounding the use of new technologies. Dr. Praytap is a director of bioinformatics and, is, and also associate professor in the School of Graduate Studies and Research at Mary, Mary Medical College. He's also the adjunct associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Vanderbilt University, where at where he directs. He directs the uh, Meharry Bioinformatics Proteomics Core Labs, and his research focuses on implementing and connecting bioinformatics and biomedical informatics approaches for health disparities research. Uh, um, so I turn it over to the two co-moderators and have take it away. Okay, thank you, Ken, and thank you, Mark. Um, is, is my audio okay? Just making sure. Yes, I can hear you fine. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so Really, uh, really enjoying this discussion so far, and thank you, NHGRI, for org organizing this. Uh, it, it's, it's, we're getting a lot of um, just, just really great perspectives on this. Uh, I'm just going to uh, introduce the uh, three speakers we have for this session. Um, our first speaker will be, uh, and, and please correct me if I if I mispronounce your names. Um, our first speaker will be Dr. Guillermo Guillermo Del Fior, uh, MD, PhD. Uh, he is an associate professor and vice chair for research at the Department of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Utah. He leads the research arm of the Reimagine EHR initiative, uh, which aims to transform clinicians' user experiences with EHR through standards-based approaches like using FHIR, SMART, and CDS hooks. Um, he is the national leader uh, and, and development of uh, health IT decision support uh, CDS standards. Um, he's been doing this for over 20 years, including um, being elected the co-chair of the HL7 CDS network, uh, CDS work group. Um, and he's also an expert on the HL7 FHIR standard whose adoption is, is a high priority from the NIH. Uh, Guillerme is also a lead developer on several CDS standards, notably the HL7 info button standard, which is required uh, for EHR certification in the US. Our second speaker will be Dr. Chunwa Wong, a PhD. Uh, Chunwa is a tenured full professor of biomedical informatics at Columbia uh, and an elected fellow of both the American College of Medical Informatics uh, and the International Academy of Health Science and Informatics. Uh, she is a, uh, a leading biomedical informatics research. She's been leading, uh, co-leading the biomedical informatics resources for the Columbia CTSA since 2011 and is an associate editor for the Journal of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, Dr. Wong has published on data-driven optimization on clinical data trial eligibility criteria, um, on scalable and portable uh, electronic phenotyping, and on EHR data quality assessments for data analytics and text knowledge engineering from a variety of tech sources, including not just the EHR, but PubMed, uh, clinical trial summaries, and, and, and so forth. And our third speaker today will be Dr. Mark Hoffman, uh, PhD. Uh, he is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Biomedical and Health Informatics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, and a research professor of pediatrics at the University of Kansas School of Medicine as well. Um, he uh, is also the chief research information officer for Children's Mercy Hospital uh, and the Children's Mercy Research Institute of Kansas City, uh, as well as being an inventor of 22 patents uh, and also a member of the American Academy of Inventors. Prior to joining Children's Mercy Hospital, Mark was the uh, AVP of research at, uh, at geno uh, for genomics uh, at Cerner, um, heading uh, a lot of their initiatives on the public health and big data research. And Mark's current research focus is on the use of massive de-identified EHR data sets uh, as a resource for evaluating real world clinical processes, digital phenotyping, uh, patient trajectories and outcomes. And uh, he's also the PI on a project examining trajectories for pediatric leukemia patients um, his team works closely with uh, the Genomic Medicine Center to support uh, HPC uh, platforms needed to accelerate genomic discovery. So with that, um, we have a, a really uh, interesting uh, docket coming up. I will hand it over to, uh, to Guillerme Delfield. 
Okay, so we will talk about uh, a really important aspect of clinical decision support, which is uh, a clinical workflows. Um, we often talk about the importance of having access to a high quality uh, structured data in computable format, and uh, as well as access to uh, logic, CDS logic in computable format. But oftentimes we overlook the importance of clinical workflows. And I would argue that uh, you can have the best data, the best CDS logic uh, without matching the clinical workflow, uh, CDS tools are very likely to fail. Um, we're also gonna briefly talk about uh, interoperability standards in this area. There's a, a, a set of emerging standards that are uh, bringing interesting opportunities for CDS, in, not only in genomics, but uh, CDS in general. Okay. So we can probably categorize clinical workflows for CDS into uh, two large buckets. There might be more, but these are, are the ones uh, most commonly found in the literature, point of care CDS uh, and population-based. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about each. Um, this scoping review on pharmacogenomics, clinical decision support, uh, I use this as an example. There have been other studies, more recent studies, uh, but this gives a good snapshot of what's going on. So they found 31 studies, all of them focused on point of care CDS, nothing on population based CDS. Um, there's a, a strong emphasis on uh, point of care alerts, um, some work on provider inbox or so delivering information to a provider's inbox in the EHR, and also uh, a lot of work on uh, genomic test reports, this different visualization approaches for that. And uh, some studies looking at uh, entering automatically uh, findings, uh, genetic findings on the patient's problem list. So let's look at a few examples uh, here, um, just to, uh, um, to illustrate the different kinds of triggers that can uh, be leveraged to present decision support to clinicians. Um, most common in pharma genomics are the pre-test and post-test uh, interactions, and uh, both are triggered by a, an event where a clinician is trying to prescribe a new medication. Um, other options beyond pharmacogenomics uh, are found in, in family history-based testing and cancer screening reminders. Uh, a really important emerging standard in this space can, that can enable all, all sorts of uh, EHR-triggered or event-triggered CDS is uh, CDS hooks. Um, it's a standard that allows an EHR upon a certain trigger um, to call out an external web service that has some kind of logic and the service brings back conclusions to, into the EHR. So for clinical genomics, you can imagine um, a centralized cloud-based service that has uh, clinical genomics knowledge encoded and updated as needed in serving multiple EHRs and multiple healthcare organizations. So you don't have to update CDS logic at each EHR at each healthcare organization uh, in that kind of framework. These are just uh, typical examples of alerts. Uh, again, the most common kind of CDS that been found in clinical genomics. Uh, the one at the top is a pretest alert. So uh, when a provider is prescribing a medication, it's uh, uh, the alert is recommending uh, the ordering of a genetic test. And the one below, the genetic test is already available and the alert recommends a dose adjustment for that medication. On-demand CDS, un uh, unlike um, uh, active CDS, uh, is used as the name implies uh, on-demand by clinicians when they feel it's appropriate. Examples are test reports uh, and info buttons. And uh, relevant standards, again, are the HL7 info button, which is required for meaningful use uh, EHR certification. And Smart on Fire is a, a, also an emerging standard that's uh, enabling the idea of an ecosystem of third-party apps that healthcare organizations can uh, purchase or download and, and enable within their EHR. So that uh, Smart on Fire, opens up uh, tremendous opportunities for innovations in, in terms of apps uh, uh, for genomics within the EHR and also patient apps. Uh, most of uh, um, the, the focus on this space has been on helping uh, clinicians and patients interpret genetic tests and also provide guidance. 
Um, here's an example of a genetic testing report with uh, associated with uh, guidance for clinicians. You see at the top a uh, number of medications for which this patient might have problems um, based on a positive test for CP2D6. Um, in this particular report, uh, if it was implemented as a smart on fire app, uh, you could imagine the report querying DHR for the patient's medication, active medications, and you could highlight those medications in the report, making the report more personalized. In terms of info buttons, this is work that we have done uh, in the context of the ClinGen project, and uh, Mark Williams was uh, part of it, and one of our students led the work. And as a demonstration, we showed how a, uh, from the patient's medications list or a prescription for clopidogrel, you can, uh, providers can click on uh, an info button and that would link directly to PharmGKB, uh, which would provide re uh, testing recommendations and those adjustment recommendations for uh, that medication. Population-based workflows, unlike point of care, happen in the back end. And um, the overall pattern is uh, you imagine an algorithm that goes out, uh, scans uh, medical records for a number of patients, identified patients who meet certain criteria, and then you can use patient outreach uh, um, approaches to find, um, recommend some kind of personalized care. And you, you can imagine things like uh, people who need some kind of, would benefit from some kind of genetic testing or genetic counseling. Um, the ability to update the test interpretation for people who already have uh, uh, sequenced and, and also people who uh, need some kind of change to clinical management based on uh, new knowledge. Probably the most important standard in this space is FHIR. So you need to be able to, uh, to identify patient cohorts. And you need to get access to data and uh, uh, that would be in a structured uh, standard format using FHIR. As an example, uh, we have this is NCI funded uh, research that's supporting a randomized trial at University of Utah and NYU. And the idea is that we created a, a population based CDS platform where we scan records of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of patients looking at their family history in the EHR and um, trying to see who are the patients who meet NCCN criteria for breast and colorectal cancer. And this is a, a snapshot of the logic for breast cancer. So the workflow works like this. Uh, we run the algorithm, find people who meet criteria, and then we use um, EHR capabilities to automatically send outreach messages to the patients who meet criteria. The message have a uh, link to a chatbot, an uh, interactive chatbot that uh, helps the patient understand the benefits, uh, logistics, and uh, other issues related to genetic testing. And at the end, they're invited to uh, do a test. If the patients desire uh, to do testing, they'll get a test kit on the mail. Um, once the results come back, a genetic counselor or a genetic counseling assistant will review. And for patients who uh, test negative, they'll get another chatbot link uh, with a post-test uh, chatbot that will explain the implications of uh, the result. If the test is positive, the patient merges into a uh, usual care workflow with a genetic counselor appointment and uh, followed by uh, looping back into primary care with uh, clinical recommendations moving forward and an update to the patient's problem list. So in summary, uh, prior research uh, in cl clinical genomic CDS have uh, strongly focused on CDS alerts. That's the most predominant kind of uh, CDS. And I would uh, uh, recommend that uh, we need to go beyond that. There's uh, many more different kinds of workflows that we should study uh, and figure out different ways to deliver clinical genomic CDS that goes beyond CDS alerts. Uh, we also need to think beyond pharmacogenomics really think about how to integrate primary, primary care more effectively, ideally without overburdening our uh, busy primary care providers. 
Uh, also think about patient outreach and engagement approaches, again, that do not rely on primary care providers having to face all those alerts. Um, and uh, we have tremendous opportunities, I think, with CDS Hooks and Smart on Fire to innovate in this space. And uh, as almost every single talk, a previous talk, touched on the point of health disparities, every time we come with these uh, new cool technologies, it's almost guaranteed we will introduce health disparities and widen the digital gap. So uh, I believe the, the idea is when we design these new innovative uh, tools, we think about health disparities from the ground up to try to avoid widening uh, those gaps as opposed to uh, addressing them after the fact. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jeremy. We have um, a few, uh, uh, we have time for a few questions. Um, and let me just make sure I get the one here that just um, came up in the chat here. Um, besides complimenting you on a great talk, um, they said that now uh, it's a point for a long time, Epic was the only EHR vendor to provide support for clinical decision support uh, system hooks. Now it's still two EHR vendors. Do you want to comment? Um, because it sounded like the uh, CDS hooks were going to be an important innovation, but it seems like maybe their penetration is, is limited. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, C CDS hooks is, is an emerging, very new standard. Um, it, it's still uh, the maturity level. HL7 has all these uh, uh, scale of maturity for the standards and CDS hooks has the, at the very early stage of maturity uh, with a draft standard approved. Uh, as um, uh, CDS hooks becomes more mature and evolves, it's quite possible that uh, EHRs will, more EHRs will start adopting. I think we're gonna see the same as we've seen with Smart on Fire, which now um, is, uh, has been adopted by a larger number of um, EHR systems. Okay, great, thanks. And there's another question. Um, as you're building this uh, at University of Utah, who's responsible for ensuring that the CDS is current and consistent with guidelines? Is it likely that these are gonna change over time? And I guess sort of thinking inter-institutionally, um, isn't there the possibility that if each health system is building its own CDS system in the manner that you did, you're going to, um, what the result will be would be care heterogeneity over time. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so at the University of Utah, and maybe Ken Kawamoto is giving a talk tomorrow, uh, uh, might touch on this, but we, we have uh, a CDS governance group that uh, they meet regularly and uh, they're in charge of reviewing the CDS logic and not monitor the CDS, CDS response over time to make sure uh, um, uh, we're not having any, any problems and, and also to optimize CDS over time. Many other institutions are following similar approaches. In terms of uh, kind of reinventing the wheel at every single organization, I believe the, the key, especially for genomics, areas that where the logic is complicated, it's expensive to uh, develop and maintain, uh, we're gonna have to be able to share logic somehow, either through cloud-based approaches where you have a web, a web services on the cloud that are uh, up, kept up to date and EHR system access those cloud-based uh, systems, or uh, you would still have a web service approach external to the EHR, but installed locally at your healthcare organization. That's probably the most common approach right now. There's significant concern from health uh, organizations to uh, call out external web services because you have uh, uh, PHI data going over the wire. So, uh, but regardless in both approaches, what you have is the logic sitting outside the EHR and being updated regularly by a central source. Okay, there's some questions that I think will be good for the panel. I just um, have one question um, from me is as part of the workflow, are you also measuring effectiveness? How are you actually accounting for people acting on these alerts as this will be sort of a theme I think that'll weave through and sort of making sure that we realize the value of these systems? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Yeah, every, every CDS needs to be monitored mm -hmm. over time because you have performance may deteriorate because of un unintended consequences, any kind of change, change in logic, change in the underlying data, changes in the workflow, clinical workflow downstream. Uh, so 
every CDS may have a different kind of measure of effectiveness. CDS alerts, you need to measure the response to alerts. Alert overrides are an example. But you also have to measure downstream in the workflow if uh, clinicians are following a recommendation of the alert. They may cancel out an alert, but still follow the recommendation at the end of their the patient encounter. Uh, other kinds of uh, like population-based approaches have a completely different kinds of measures. Uh, for example, you need to measure patient engagement. Are, are patients um, following, uh, if, if we're sending any kind of outreach through chatbots, for example, we measure uh, the rate at uh, which they uh, actually engage with the chatbots and, and uh, also measure their decisions. Okay, great, thanks. Well, thank you for staying perfectly on time. And I think um, we're gonna transition now to Dr. Wen. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chung Hua Wong. I'm from Columbia University. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so in my talk, uh, I will share our institutional uh, experience of in realizing the value of genomic decision support uh, at a point of care and talk about the opportunities, challenges, and strategies for success. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of my collaborator and mentor, uh, mentee, uh, uh, Dr. Jordan Nestor. Uh, she's an assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University and also a fellow uh, in genomic medicine research and then she's really the driver behind the results and the studies I'm going to present at, at today's talk. So as we uh, encourage clinicians to embrace and practice genomic medicine at the point of care, uh, it's very important to uh, recognize and support their unmet information needs. So here we identify some example uh, unmet information needs uh, let's uh, often uh, ask among clinicians when we talk about genomic medicine. So for example, uh, what, genomic, uh, what genetic syndrome should I suspect in this, this patient sitting in front of us? And what genetic test should we order? And how do we interpret genetic findings? And what are the next steps in the patient uh, disease management? And when should we refer the patient? Who else in the family should get tested? and where can we find management guidelines. So in order to address these information needs, uh, the most promising tool or uh, approach is to develop the clinical decision support embedded in the EHR environment. They are the um, most promising portable and uh, um, scalable solution to address these needs and also fill the knowledge gaps for our frontline clinicians. Um, so in order to explore the feasibility of developing uh, genomic decision support in our EHR environment, we conducted uh, two studies in, um, as part of our eMERGE3 pro uh, project. Um, so next I'm going to uh, briefly describe the first study. Uh, this study is also in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Mark Williams. So we, um, we focus on one disease which is a uh, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. And then this is uh, uh, one of the top three um, genetic disorder syndromes uh, identified by CDC. It's a uh, population prevalence is one in 500 percent uh, patients. And then we took uh, the 2018 guideline for early management of patients of, F8, uh, of acute ischemic stroke. And then we, we turned this 120 page guideline into a decision tree um, and then embed it into our EHR process. So this is a, the first step is we select this guideline and convert the text information into a computable, computer interpretable modules. Uh, we include in this uh, decision tree module, we include a, a corresponding lab test that's available in EHR environment. And then the decision uh, notes uh, if the patient currently have a high intensity um, statin, um, then we will look at the most recent LDL level. And then if the LDL, lev or LDL level meets the threshold, and then we will continue with statin or maintain the aspirin. 
Um, so this guideline was reviewed by one of our senior lipid experts, Dr. Henry Ginsberg at Columbia University, and then was uh, agreed um, by our uh, expert panel that the content is accurate. And then after we build this um, decision model, we conducted a small group scenario-based qualitative study to evaluate the usefulness and the usability uh, of this uh, decision support tool um, among our clinician target users. And then, and here we include some um, comments of our uh, and feedback from our clinician uh, uh, testers. So basically the um, key finding is although they acknowledge the general um, usefulness of this tool, they alluded to a lot of unmet information needs. So for example, they may say, oh, I'd like to see a link to the full guideline in a tool uh, which will provide the uh, better context uh, behind the decision um, uh, recommendations of the tool. And then they also uh, talk about the complexity, like this doesn't work when the LDR is already less than 70, um, the users, it is not prompt to start high intensity statin. Um, and so these are kind of prompt us to think more about the deeper about the user, unmet user needs. Um, so in order to make this work in an EHR environment, we, build, we further implemented this as a dashboard in our INYP EHR environment through a participatory design process uh, going, by going through multiple iterative design evaluation uh, and refinement of the user interface design. And uh, the, uh, David and Yiping are the technical um, programmers helping implementing this. And then, so in this uh, dashboard, uh, we actually um, display the relevant clinical data of the patient with the diagnostic genetic finding of FH. And within the dashboard, we also show the decision support tool to, to guide the clinician. In, we, we are hoping that this tool can guide the clinician regarding the next steps uh, for managing the patient. Um, so, uh, in this process, we run into a lot of uh, social technical challenges. Um, so here I included three um, most significant ones. The first one is there are competing guidelines actually for managing a uh, patient with genetic syndrome. Um, so we end up have to merge uh, multiple guidelines with uh, contradicting information. And then we also um, encountered uh, barriers to integrate raw genomic data into EHRs. There were still a lot of controversies regarding, you know, what data goes into EHR, goes into the production system. Uh, so some information ended as the PDF files uh, as a, a certified genetic test results. And also the heterogeneity of IT infrastructure is the persistent challenge. Um, so we, um, as uh, some speakers mentioned in previous talk, we adopt a model of the peripheral CDS design, uh, building an interactive web-based decision support that can talk to our EHR system. But the majority of data knowledge base was sub sub stored separately from our production EHR environment. So that's not ideal, but it's our workaround solution. Um, so next I'm going to transition to the second study and then uh, more details can be found in the upcoming uh, JAMIA open article. We just get this uh, accepted. So I talk about the process of understanding user needs and also build it. Then the next question is if we build it, will people come and use it? So the, we, in order to address this question, we uh, conducted a log based EHR log based analysis so to uh, just uh, using a non-intrusive uh, approach to assess uh, if the embedded genomic data will be used and then to what degree will be useful for clinicians. Um, um, and then the finding is very striking. Basically, we find only 1% of all the eMERGE 3 genetic tested results in the EHR were viewed by clinicians who did not initiate genetic tests 
So this is uh, uh, the breakdown of the users who um, uh, will find to review or access the genetic data in the EHR environment. Uh, we look at, you know, if there's any role difference, if there's any specialty difference, um, if there's a time difference, you know, people uh, working at certain hours were more frequently, uh, more likely to look at the results. Um, and also we look at the setting, like outpatient and ambulatory setting. And then um, again, so more of the uh, results from this study uh, can be found in the upcoming uh, JMIA Open article. So um, from these two studies, we, re um, we want to um, be summarize the key barriers and challenges and then uh, recommendations about uh, uh, how to go going forward. So we think there's a big disconnect between the genetic uh, genomic discovery, which is uh, which uh, generated by uh, genomic scientists, researchers, and also healthcare delivery, who are primarily driven by uh, frontline clinicians. Um, I think our clinicians, they, they, they are eager to adopt, embrace uh, genomic medicine, but they still have a lot of unmet information needs, as mentioned earlier. Um, the guideline um, resolving the um, contradicting knowledge among different gui competing different guidelines, and then the IT infrastructure, all these issues need to be resolved. And also the second uh, barrier uh, is the lack of coordination, the lack of work workflow support. This was also mentioned by the previous speaker. And then the policy for liability um, at hospitals regarding what data should go, can go into EHR. Uh, there are a lot of controversies uh, still at the um, hospital uh, in, um, at the organizational level. And then the third barrier um, is the lack of current knowledge to practice evidence-based genomic medicine among clinicians. As um, a lot of the genomic knowledge were rapid, uh, rapidly evolving. Um, so the variant reclassification is a big threat for building uh, reliable genomic decision support because the knowledge is constantly changing. We currently don't have the infrastructure to uh, rapidly incorporate this uh, changing, uh, evolving knowledge into the um, decision support uh, infrastructure. Um, and so that's actually can hurt the trust in uh, the recommendations made by the decision support tools uh, by among clinicians. And then also the poor EHR user interface, uh, alert fatigue, information fragmentation. This is also a huge barrier here. Uh, not only for like the case study here for other diseases, we also run into this issue. Um, and then the no genomic knowledge base, as I mentioned, um, uh, a lot of our evidence about genomic medicine is locked in free text PubMed articles. And then there are so many, um, how can we make this genomic knowledge computable? Um, so we probably need more advanced tools to be able to mine the literature and then converting this uh, knowledge into computable form and make it interoperable with our current decision support tool. We think that's critical and seamless integration of this knowledge base with the um, uh, PubMed literature. Um, so we also know there are a lot of public database uh, such as ClinVar, ClinGen, and, and then PubMed literature. So very often we also, we need to link this uh, knowledge base and then PubMed to better interpret the conclusions, uh, put the conclusions in the context. So that's why we also need to better mine the PubMed literature. And then finally to integrate knowledge into EHR environment for automatic triggering of genomic practice guidelines and how can we harmonize different guidelines. So all these are uh, potential um, informatics and data science uh, research topics, I think are highly relevant to uh, enabling precision medicine. Um, so um, we also think there are some enablers such as uh, uh, um, build up or leverage the synergy between NHGRI and uh, NCATS, uh, especially we have the, you know, the network of CTSA almost a lot 
every in, academic institution, their uh, CTSA hub, um, how can we develop a learning health system to incorporate this evolving genomic knowledge into the CDS development, build best practice among the community. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, can be done. And, um, and also incorporate the uh, advance in um, biomedical informatics, clinical informatics, a lot of EHR based decision support uh, strategies and methods have been developed. How can we integrate that with the implementation science for genomic medicine? Um, and I'm, as I mentioned, text mining uh, and knowledge uh, engineering about genomic knowledge, uh, knowledge using a free text, PubMed text, and also FIRE as uh, mentioned by previous speakers. So, uh, so basically we feel the um, strategies for success should really be stakeholder-centered, user-centered, social technical uh, approach um, and informatics uh, research for genomic evidence computing. How can we make this evidence computable, interoperable, make the knowledge base uh, um, interoperable with the EHR? Um, and then really have a large shared centralized uh, genomic knowledge base that everybody can do, you know, knowledge uh, data provenance, um, knowledge uh, ver uh, version control, things like that, uh, um, make the, the knowledge more accessible and then uh, trustworthy for our frontline clinicians and harmonize different interests of multiple stakeholders, forge collaboration, and uh, really provide clinician-centered workflow support. So I think this is my last slides. Thank you very much. Dr. Wang, thank you for an excellent presentation. I think we have time for a couple of clarifying questions. Um, one is from um, one of our other panelists who says that um, at your institution at Columbia that you have a homegrown um, electronic health record. And can you just comment on how scalable are some of the concerns that you've mentioned about the EHR interface? How scalable are they to other commercial systems? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, we have a complex uh, EHR ecosystem. So we have our homegrown system, INYP, but we also have Epic. And in the past, we had a Crown. So we, um, our general approach is, you know, INYP provides a very flexible um, test bed for us to, you know, design and test the uh, novel um, decision support in, in INYP. And then once it, it's working there, then we can uh, migrate or move it to the more standardized uh, EHR platform such as Epic. So that's uh, the approach that we have been taken. Um, so right now, um, we, or, we already have uh, Epic in um, many of our practice. So um, our um, in IT team, they are actively working with our IP, uh, EPIC team uh, by leveraging FIRE uh, to develop, um, to use these latest standards to develop this uh, CDS. So hopefully going forward, we will have more FIRE-based solution. Yeah. Okay, great. And, um, you know, some of the strategies that, to overcome the um, barriers that you mentioned was you described what you called a socio tech technical yeah. approach of stakeholder mm -hmm. engagement or user-centered design. Yeah, excellent. And you had a, a good list of stakeholders here. Um, just curious, we've talked a lot about patient empowerment or patient centricity. Do you also think about engaging the patients as part of this user-centered design? And is, would you recommend that we, we uh, broaden the stakeholder engagement to include that perspective? Uh, that's a great question. So um, we definitely, um, have a separate uh, team which is um, highly focused on uh, patient engagement, uh, patient facing, like, um, you know, um, what to say, we, we have a separate team to do patient engagement. But here, uh, I, I think we also need to look at the unmet uh, in information needs of clinicians. Because uh, after all, the, they are the um, people or users of these decision support tools. They also have the knowledge and an um, authority. So I think uh, these two parts should go in parallel 
uh, and then um, and then eventually, you know, all is will be um, harmonized together. <clears throat> okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much. And now we're going to turn to the presentation of "We Built It, But Will They Come?" by Dr. Hoffman. So, um, and I should uh, use the similar expression. Um, so, um, my comments come from. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, Twenty years of you know, advocating for integration of genomic information into the electronic health record. I spent 16 years in industry, and then the past eight years uh, affiliated with academic medical organizations. So I've been able to see both sides of it. And so my, my comments really come from the perspective of, um, you know, what are some of the challenges and barriers? What are some potential solutions to those? So um, but we, uh, you know, almost 20 years ago, filed a patent. The U.S. patent was actually not, this one was not accepted in the U.S., um, but the concept is the alert user if a clinical order is contraindicated by genetic information. So, um, you know, these ideas have been out there for quite a while. I think um, in some ways maybe we were too early. So if you go to the next slide, please. So, um, you know, both in my industry experience, but also things I've observed in academic medical settings, um, you know, many important and useful things have been built. So um, certainly a lot of useful development in the laboratory information arena have really enabled the processing and generation of genomic findings. Um, we took a stab at the terminology standardization by developing the clinical bioinformatics ontology. And this would have been in the mid 2000s. And it was a semantically structured ontology that allowed the mapping of variant findings to a hierarchy that could be um, crawled semantically. It worked great when, genetic, when we were still in the genetic medicine era but we couldn't curate, you know, once we started to see really the, the growth of sequencing, it became very difficult to create standardized concepts for every possible um, variant that would surface through diagnostic sequencing. And then we also had a uh, clinical decision support strategy. Um, some successes were, you know, in the laboratory arena, definitely an appetite for our capabilities to support lab workflow to generate those discrete standardized results. There's definitely strong support and interest among specialists in genetics and genomics. Um, some clinical specialties, especially oncology, um, have, have a strong appetite for this integration. But when you look at the numbers of where providers are, generalists and most specialties um, still haven't really jumped onto uh, just, you know, of all the things they want, genomic integration typically isn't very high on their list. And so that still remains, I think, a gap that um, we need to really continue to pursue. So go ahead to the next slide. So in my experience, I, I group um, the periods of EHR genomics into three phases. The first thing I noticed is, you know, beginning to talk with physicians about genomics and they still weren't really ready to start thinking about how to integrate genomics into their practice. And then between 2000 and 2008, you know, frequent barrier was what is uh, at that time what we would call an EMR. And many organizations either didn't have an EMR or they had a homegrown EMR. Um, we did make progress in the laboratory systems and lab automation. The next phase um, was, you know, meaningful use provided funding for the purchase and installation of EMRs. Um, so the, the barrier of the absence of an EHR was resolved in a dramatic way in the mid you know, late 2000s, early uh, 2000 uh, and teens. Um, 
but the process of implementing those EHRs were completely consuming to the organizational um, leadership responsible for fulfilling the uh, meaningful use checklists, um, which for the most part really had very little to um, relate to genomics. What we did see in the field, and we've seen examples of this throughout today's presentations, are creative organizations that worked within the existing capabilities of their EHR to do ground up build for either discrete data capture or uh, genetic based decision support. I think now we're in an era where EHRs are implemented, they're operational. Um, and I think as now you're, you're looking at how to utilize genetic and genomic information there's so many startup companies um, offering, you know, variant analysis. Um, there's still definitely a view that this is an academic exercise. Um, on the positive side, I think patient portals are definitely fully implemented now. And so there are means to really engage with patients. And then, you know, we can't also ignore, you know, right now we're heads down focused in a pandemic. And so, most institutional decisions um, need to be framed in how is this going to help us during the pandemic. Um, so when we look at institutional priorities, we've seen this evolution, um, and I think it's an important way to frame some of the uh, the stakeholder perspectives. Uh, with that background, go ahead to the next slide. So. At Children's Mercy, we, we see a lot of this playing out. We have a fantastic genomic medicine center um, that eight years ago, they were the first to um, do a complete sequencing, both the sequencing and the analysis in about 24 hours. Um, so they've been involved in diagnostic and research sequencing for a long time. We have an active initiative now called Genomic Answers for Kids. Um, the goal is to sequence 30,000 children and their family members. Um, we're already, you know, having massive amounts of data generated. Consistent with that follow-up question for the previous presentation, you know, we really see the most important stakeholders are the patients, the, in our setting, the children who will be diagnosed and potentially have um, some treatment options that wouldn't have been available had they not gone through the process. I'm still a big believer in pharmacogenomic decision support, I think, for safe healthcare. I think there's so much missed opportunity there as well. So the, the architecture of our genome center, if you go to the next slide, I think is very consistent with things we've seen and heard today. We have the electronic health record the EHR can generate a test order that's received by the sequencing lab. They perform bioinformatics work to generate their variant interpretation. Um, initially, that was with a homegrown um, set of systems. We're in the process of migrating a lot of that to the cloud for greater efficiencies, and we're evaluating commercial options. Um, the painful part to me is that the output is still a PDF report and that that PDF report is how the provider sees that. And to me, a PDF is a dead end for decision support and reanalysis. So um, this is the general architecture that we see at Children's Mercy. And I think, again, it's very consistent with what many of the organizations that we've heard from today also have. If you go ahead to the next slide. So, one of the tasks for this panel was to think about resource allocation. And so I, I've kind of articulated on the EHR side of funding, um, what I've observed is most funding goes to employees and to people. Um, there's very little willingness to invest, um, you know, in activities that will increase utilization among providers. Um, human factors. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we've heard some other comments consistent with that. Um, in our setting and really all three of the settings I'm affiliated with, FIRE is interesting to the organization, but we're not using it in widespread practice. 
where we do see a lot of the direction of funding is on the laboratory side. So um, there's we're making major investments in cloud storage and analytics. Um, next generation sequencing is generating long reads. And so the whole informatics framework to support that process is very much a, an area that we're investing in. And in the laboratory side, they seem very willing and able to invest in third party niche applications. They also have gaps. And so, you know, standardized clinical interpretations has come up as a, a, a gap or need. Um, and then I anticipate policy clarity around automated reinterpretation of results. And so there's definitely a need on the policy side to offer some clarity around how that will work um, as we don't need to do a new sample, but new findings change how we interpret those samples. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So some of my, you know, just very direct observations from the field. I think FIRE does have a lot of promise and potential, but it's still early. Um, I think in many organizations, we know that we need to address it, but there's not yet the experts in-house who are ready to tackle that. Um, I'm a big fan in the pharmacogenomics world of CPIC, and I think there's a need for some more consensus-based um, process for um, interpretation and how to incorporate those findings into clinical practice. Um, the uh, really key thing is, and I think this came out in some of the survey findings too, in many health systems, there's a tremendous reluctance to use open source applications in our production environments. The uh, And now in this era of ransomware, um, I think the security teams have you know pretty strong footing to push back on things that um, are either developed in academic mode or don't have the security features that they that they see with many commercial offerings. I think, um, as I said, labs are willing to pay for third party niche applications, but um, in the provider side of the equation, I see less willingness to pay for what I think of as EHR adjacent genomics clinical decision support. So um, for, in terms of commercial decision support or even things that are developed academically, um, the appetite to, to incorporate those among providers when you get out into the either the generalists or the broader group of specialists, um, I think there is that reluctance to do that. So if you go ahead to the next slide. So what do we do about it? Um, again, my thoughts are consistent with many of the comments earlier today, but I do think we need to really think about some rebalancing. I think um, at Children's Mercy, we have a really um, impressive um, genomic medicine short course and providers of any specialty and in some cases, employees of Children's Mercy who aren't, in, aren't providers um, spend a week, their personal genome is sequenced, and then they learn the basics of how to process and interpret that. That gives them the exposure to these concepts that currently is not offered in medical school or other settings. Um, so I think providing that training and exposure to these concepts that are daunting to people that um, don't live in this world as most of us on this workshop do. I'm also a big believer in human factors. Um, I think the experience of interacting with complex information is a deterrent to many providers. And so I think the human factors element um, is really important. How do we present these complicated findings in a manner that can be digested and is actionable. Um, I've already commented about content. I think economics is also critical. I think um, being able to demonstrate the financial benefits of using genomic information to improve care is an area that needs additional investment and support. I think um, the 
more we can do to increase the demand for genomic analysis and testing, all of the other things that we're aspiring to will start to fall into place, but we really need to put more focus on the financial benefits. And then again, having lived in this world, EHR vendors respond to their clients. And so if they see their client base pushing for and asking for genomic features, they're more likely to make the development investments in that. We did that for a long time at Cerner. Epic has more recently taken a lot of steps to incorporate those concepts into their systems. Um, but they think everybody would agree that they have a long way to go. And so keep pushing those vendors to um, um, provide those capabilities so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over um, in your local implementations. So these are some things that I think if there was additional attention to them would, would really start to help shift the balance and increase the demand. So go ahead to the last slide. So despite all of this, I am still cautiously optimistic that there is a place for um, genomic integration with electronic health records. And I hope to see um, you know, progress more on the uh, consumer side rather than the generation of the results side. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Great, thanks Dr. Hoffman, that was really helpful. Um, I have one specific question that's come through um, for you. And then I, I think what I'd like to do is also invite Sid to participate, but I have a number of sort of broad questions that I'd like all the panelists to respond to. So um, since you brought it up, uh, the question about uh, data security, um, if you could just comment on some sort of solutions to addressing um, uh, what we need to do to optimize data security, um, what, you know, given all the hacks that we've heard about, um, you know, about China, for example, acquiring sequencing data, how do we put security into the workflows between vendors and providers and participants? Sure. Um, so one of the things I've found is just engaging early with our security team rather than at the end of a process is helpful. Um, getting their comfort level and treating them as a partner rather than an adversary um, is, is an important way. You know, they'll understand, you know, what they expect in terms of how those interfaces are secured. Um, and so I think that's a key part of um, working through some of these issues is trying to treat this as a partnership. As we're going through our cloud migration, you know, our security group has a lot of concerns, but, you know, I've articulated the cloud is in many ways more secure than what you would see in a lot of local installations. And so I think um, there's a lot of advantages, even from the security perspective of moving workflows to a cloud environment. Okay, great. So, uh, in keeping with the chat, um, Marilyn uh, has a question. Um, Marilyn, can you can, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and go ahead and ask? Um, this is for Mark and Chenwa. Sure. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Okay. Great. So, while both of you talked, I kept coming back to this point that came up really early this morning in the strategic plan, and this is training. And specifically here, though, it's the training of the the typical clinicians. I'm not thinking the academic medicine clinician scientists who are embedded in this space. I'm thinking of primary care. I'm thinking of your standard nephrologist and your standard cardiologist who isn't so focused in cardiovascular genetics. How do we get genomic medicine, so these disease risk genes, but and also pharmacogenomics more embedded in their medical education? Because I, I do think a huge part of the resistance is that they're busy, they don't have time. They don't really know much about this. And so they just kind of aren't interested. And so the only way that I can think to get them interested is for them to realize that, you know, on the pharmacogenomics end, they could actually prescribe medications quicker to the right patient if they had that information and used it. They wouldn't keep coming back saying, my medicine's not working or I'm having side effects if they got the right medication. Or you know, they might be able to diagnose something faster if they did a, an exome panel and saw that this is actually a, a genetic disorder, not just a, a kind of consequence of lots of symptoms. There's actually a genetic disorder here, but they're not trained to even think about genomic medicine. So I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on how do we kind of infiltrate medical schools? I feel like that's a huge piece of it. 
Yeah, I don't have the data on my fingertips, but you know, I've seen just the just in terms of the medical school curriculum, just a few hours at most dedicated to genetics. And I think, you know, it's not just not having time, but I think it's intimidating to um, to many providers. And I think kind of finding ways to integrate it both into the education and then, you know, practice. Um, I continue to believe pharmacogenomics is the most accessible um, aspect of this, as well as in some cases, um, you know, rare disease diagnosis. Um, but, you know, we, we have to get it down to the provider training to start to crack that. I think there's also what I sometimes call point of care education, and that's not necessarily an alert, but, um, you know, something that's expressed in accessible language. A lot of, you know, pushing a provider to a ClinVar website where they see RSIDs. If you don't know what an RSID is, that's not meaningful to you. So we need things that are expressed in more accessible content. Yeah, um, I'm also thinking like, uh, you know, the diagnosis and management of genetic disorder, disorders uh, requires, it's still a team sport. Like, uh, so this is why we need better workflow support and coordination between the primary care providers and the um, genetics uh, counselor and um, clinical geneticists. So um, right now I feel like we, don't have a lot of infrastructure to um, coordinate the referral and then uh, the collaboration between uh, these two diff uh, different roles. Um, another thing is uh, in terms of training, because we also emphasize evidence-based medicine. So what's, uh, what is the computable, easy, accessible evidence for genomic medicine at a point of care? Uh, so that's why I was um, thinking about we need better infrastructure to make this evidence um, accessible uh, at the, uh, for um, EHR-based decision support. A lot of knowledge right now is really locked in pre-text guideline and PubMed literature. How can we make those available, interoperable with CDS uh, design, design um, infrastructure? So these are the things I think uh, these other areas needs a lot of development. <clears throat> so a number of you have talked about um, the concerns around the cost of doing some of this and to demonstrate to payers and others that it, it is uh, a useful thing to do. Um, this is also sort of a bridge to some of the comments from the last panel. Um, as you, from your, each of you, as you um, think about it from your perspective, um, what, would, what would you say is the rationale um, to uh, health systems outside of academic medical centers that are funded to do sort of this very technical development to invest in the information technology capabilities required to adopt genomic medicine? Is there some way to essentially demonstrate the value of the investment in this infrastructure in a way that will make it more um, uh, useful and sustainable over time. And maybe, Jeremy, we could start with you since you've been, um, we haven't had a chance to hear from you uh, recently. Yeah, so um, that's a really complicated problem and, and not just with genomics. I mean, it, it, there, it's been a decade long uh, challenge in sharing clinical decision support capabilities, logic, whatever across health systems beyond the academic medical centers. We, we do a lot of work with community health centers uh, in the Rocky Mountain states. And uh, low hanging fruit for them are basic things like colorectal cancer screening, where we have you know rates from 20 to 40%. Um, so uh, yeah, genetics doesn't even get even close to uh, their priority list. So it, it, it's a very challenging problem. I, I don't know what's the solution for that. That's why um, I, I'm thinking like, um, 
I'm thinking, you know, we have CTSA, which is very comprehensive. You know, we have learning health system, implementation science, uh, uh, community engagement, patient engagement within CTSA. That's why I'm thinking for genomic medicine, we also need a learning health system. Uh, uh, like uh, it's potential that we can like leverage le a lot of development in a CTSA uh, uh, space and then um, potentially leverage the community engagement, patient engagement development there to help address the needs here. Mark, did you want to say anything? I think another important aspect is, you know, across all specialties, providers will have patients that they suspect are being bounced around. Mm -hmm. And those will be people who are often on a diagnostic odyssey. And that can be a five to seven year process. It's enormously expensive to the health system. But because they get punted from specialist to specialist, there's not always that high level visibility. And so I think, you know, recognizing a patient who's on a diagnostic odyssey, trying to refer them sooner to um, genomic analysis is also an important part of this. Okay, great. Uh, I'm seeing that Mark uh, Williams has a specific comment that he wants to make or a question. Did you want to chime in, Mark? Yes, thanks, uh, Pat. Um, I, I wanted, uh, um, Mark just uh, made a very uh, interesting uh, comment about the um, diagnostic odyssey. And, and I think there's uh, a real interesting opportunity uh, to think about some, um, this may be a little bit more towards uh, session two, but I know that in the sustainability discussion for the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, there's been a lot of uh, interest in predictive modeling uh, about how we can actually identify these people early on uh, in the um, process rather than having an undiagnosed diseases program that is a program of last resort where you've already spent tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars and now you're adding sequencing on uh, at the very end of that. And I think the work that Lisa presented is another way that that um, uh, a phenotype approach could be taken. But that wasn't the point I was actually going to make is just uh, I, I had to get that in um, <laughs> since Mark teed it up for me. Um, the question I had is that we're actually generating a lot of sequence clinically, but we're treating it just like any other laboratory test, which is we do the test for an indication, we look at it, and then we move on. And that to me is a real waste. Um, we could reuse that information for many different purposes down the road. Uh, if we thought about the durability of the data, as opposed to thinking about it like every other laboratory test. And so I was interested to hear, um, particularly from Mark, um, given the maturity of your program, whether you're, um, how you're dealing with the sort of reuse uh, of data. And certainly if the other speakers have uh, thoughts or experience with that, I'd be interested to hear from them as well. Yeah, I think, um... Currently, and we still have a lot of work to do on figuring out how to, you know, regularly reinterpret the data and then return those results. That is a part of the genomic answers for kids um, research protocol, um, which is intended then to inform eventual wider scale clinical practice. Um, and that's where I think also there's just a lack of policy clarity. So, so much of this diagnostic work is done under a pathology mindset and model where the test is ordered, paid for, billed, and interpreted, and that's the end of the process. But, you know, if the lab is going to reinterpret it, is that also a billable event? Or, you know, those are things that um, I think need, as I commented, need some further clarification. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, we're winding down to our last um, five or six minutes here. And just to sort of facilitate the summary, each of you did an excellent job of identifying the barriers to clinical implementation of genomic CDS. And I'm wondering if um, I can press you to sort of to prioritize from a research agenda perspective, which of those barriers you that you've identified in your talks you think um, could be framed as questions for NHGRI? <clears throat> to potentially support. 
So Guillermo, I'll just start with you and then we'll proceed through the panelists. Yeah, I think I urge us to think about workflows that do not rely on the primary care providers as the main source for doing extra work. We, we keep coming up with innovations that at the end of the line, it's always uh, adding burden to uh, primary care providers and they have way too much on their plate. I mean, in a 10 minute visit where they have to go through uh, four or five chronic diseases and think about a number of issues, educate patients, look at their compliance to medications, you still wanna add genetics to their plate, this is just not gonna happen. So we need to think about innovative workflows that uh, tap into other healthcare workers in the workflow pipeline and, and uh, also very, very important to try to engage the patients. Okay, great. Dr. Wen? Sorry, I unmuted. Yeah, so um, for me, I would prioritize uh, the development of a standards-based, computable, evidence-based for practicing genomic medicine high. Because right now, um, a lot of information are really locked in free text and not easily accessible uh, for clinicians. They also don't have time to read you know, tons of papers um, at a point of care. And a searching for relevant evidence is also very hard. So if we can build a shareable, um, centralized, standards-based, interoperable knowledge base that make this genomic evidence uh, easy to access and then integrate at the point of care, I think that will help with a, a lot of uh, the needs uh, for developing genomic decision support. So just for a follow-up question, you did a lot of nice stakeholder engagement work in the study that you presented, um, you know, but you only had like a very low uptake of some of the alerts that your system provided. Are there particular, um, uh, if, if, if we would hear directly from the clinicians, let's say, what, what might they say? Is it really development of standards for practicing genomic medicine that they would say would help them more, uh, be more likely to, to use this information as part of the CDS? What, what would they say from their perspective? Yeah, I think this low uptake, it can be attributed to multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, it can be they are already pressed by time. They don't have you know, time to look at additional data in addition to the uh, frequent data that uh, they use for the patient in front of them. So I think uh, it can also be due to the uh, user interface design. Um, and then also can be due, uh, due to the lack of coordination, like who is supposed to look at what data, right? Uh, who is responsible for uh, integrating the genomic information into the care, patient care, lack of familiarity. So all these can be uh, causes. So I think um, this, it's, it's complex. I definitely more studies will be needed. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, no, that, that, that was great, thanks. And then maybe we'll just close with you, uh, Mark, with a comment, and then I think Sid is gonna summarize. <clears throat> yeah, I think some research into the economic benefits of doing genomic analysis for both the health system and the patient, you know, there's um, some compelling evidence that it can be cost effective to incorporate um, genomic information and especially pharmacogenomic information. But I think further investment in that will, um, will really help as well as clarification of the payment structure for providers and reimbursement, um, all of those still, I think, feel like areas of confusion. So I think research and communication around those topics. Yeah. Is so, to, to look at cost effectiveness, you need a, a agreement about um, credible effectiveness measures. What would you recommend? I mean, some of the things, you know, I've seen in the literature about, adherence to recommended practice or uh, medication decision quality or even patient outcome measures. Is there an effectiveness measure that you would recommend to do the cost effectiveness analysis? Um, I think that's a lot closer to your area than mine, but I think the, uh, I think patient outcomes is the, uh, ultimately the, again, that's the stakeholder we need to, to okay. focus on. Okay, great, thanks. All right, Sid. And thanks uh -huh. to all the panelists.
Sure. I, I, I think um, given that this is a uh, stakeholder perspective, I just I just wanted to, to bring up a point that when we had a pre meet with, with uh, some of the some of the uh, presenters, we thought we had a pretty um, uh, overlapping uh, uh, mutual view of what a stakeholder would be, even though we knew we were coming from different places. So I just wanted to put that into um, a, a discussion for tomorrow or, or you know, ongoing is that even within this uh, group, which is fairly um, you know, uh, specific, um, th that, that, that discussion goes on about like, you know, who really is the stakeholder and how can we better define that? So, so that's, I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, you know, that, was a, that was a very good intro to a discussion are looking forward to uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, I, I think with that, uh, we, we are at time. So uh, I, I think we'll hand it back to, uh, to Mark with a C and Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the, our co-moderators and our presenters for a wonderful session. So we are at the hour and I thought I'd just share with you some of the things I took home from this, from today's session. Um, I, I let you know that this is not comprehensive, <laughs> but just to, just to kind of try to summarize what I took from this. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? And if so, which one are you seeing? Summary yeah. of day one. Yes. Okay. So yeah, slide, yeah. uh, some of the things I took from today's meeting was there's an area, there's a need to understand that there's different barriers regarding the implementation of Duma-based clinical informatics tools between rural and urban hospitals. And that what type of research that we're trying to take needs to be able to address those barriers so we can get broad implementation. We also need to understand more about the, the there also additional work that needs to be done both on the genotype and the phenotype representation to make them both useful for by systems. Um, we've made progress in the genotype, but it's not complete. And we definitely need to improve on the efforts that we're doing as far as phenotype representation. Uh, we also need to make sure that whatever algorithms or tools that we're developing, uh, that we make sure we address the biases that are negatively affecting people of color when, when they're being implemented in care. Um, one thing that's common that was across, uh, another thing that was common across this was better workflows are needed, but these workflows need to be developed and implemented and maintained with input by the clinical journalist research community that can go beyond just the clinician's use. Uh, we also need to make sure that progress, even though we acknowledge that there's progress is made um, in trying to achieve the elements from Emma's described in the Disrata, there still remains a lot to be accomplished. So there's areas of research that needs to be focused on those on those remaining elements that we need to start on and also those that we've made effort in, but also to improve on. Um, there's a need to understand more about provider payer incentives to implement genomic-based clinical informatics resources and tools. If we don't get the incentives from the provider payers, then we're kind of stuck in the water in some regards. Uh, we also want to understand how open source tools can be developed, but also in the manner that they can address security concerns. Um, Fire and CD hooks were mentioned throughout the, today's sessions, um, and they are used, con and we, this group considers them useful resources, but it still wasn't clear to me um, how they can be used for clinical genomics research. Um, and I think that some, each of us are trying, to, the community is also trying to understand more about. Uh, we also need to address provider training. Um, and we need to have, we need, there's a need to have a shareable interoperable genomic knowledge base. So Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, because I know I missed several things. This is just what I could take in <laughs> while I was also trying to listen to, to, the, to the, everybody else's presentation. Yeah, no, I think those are good. I do have a few other um, takeaways. I was particularly struck by the, uh, uh, the way Chenhua um, talked about the socio-technical challenges and strategies, which I thought was a really nice overarching thing. So I've already uh, asked to steal Part of that for the uh, summary tomorrow for our summary discussion. Um, I think there's some interesting um, uh, opportunities relating to research um, uh, agendas around policy and education. Um, uh, I'm, of course, always uh, on the lookout for um, uh, the patient centeredness. I think that that's something that uh, there's a real opportunity to explore in more detail. Um, uh, I was really uh, interested in some of the bias. And I know you had uh, specifically uh, referenced uh, uh, a bias of the data related to concepts of race and ethnicity. But I think my takeaway from Dr. Jeff was that the bias is probably much broader than that. And so uh, thinking about um, a bias um, uh, uh, more broadly uh, will, be, uh, will be important. Um, and I think also uh, the need for 
um, uh, some research into evaluation and methods uh, is still needed. So um, those are some things that I would uh, say in addition um, to that. There's also an interesting comment made about the business model for research. Um, how can we engage a broad audience of stakeholders, including the patients, the providers, um, systems, vendors, uh, et cetera? Uh, and uh, what, uh, is there a sustainability uh, piece to that? So uh, what um, will happen um, uh, uh, overnight is that uh, I'm gonna ask Ken to send me his slides that he is actually working on. Uh, I'll start to add in some of the uh, uh, pencil and paper stuff that I've been working on because I'm old. Um, and we'll uh, uh, merge those together and that'll be sort of the first half of uh, the summary uh, presentation that we'll do at the end of the day tomorrow. But we'll be doing the same exercise during the next uh, two sessions, four and five, to uh, grab important content there. Uh, so that at the uh, end of the discussion period, we should hopefully have a pretty clear idea of where we want to go from a research perspective that will be um, incorporating your feedback and uh, hopefully to some degree some uh, endorsements. So with that, um, that's all I have. So thank you, Mark. And thank you to the participants, the co-moderators, the speakers, and the attendees. Uh, we, will, we will meet again at noon tomorrow uh, for sessions four and Thank you very much. And we'll close this meeting out for the day. Have a nice evening or afternoon, depending upon where you are. <laughs> Take Bye, care. everyone. Bye. Bye.